talking about becoming a better you. And admittedly, um, it, it's, a, it's a long process, but it's working. Um, I, I'm, I, I got to speak for myself, testimony. I'm not where I should be, and I know some of you out there as pastor think I should be perfect, um, but you don't have a perfect pastor. Just ask my wife. Um, but uh, the beauty of it is I'm not what I used to be. And uh, every day the Lord is uh, working on me and doing something, so I see it working. Now, while that's my testimony, that can be yours also, uh, that you see the Lord doing some things in your life, uh, showing you that he is at work, a uh, big old sign on the front of you that says, under construction, and, uh, and that God is continually working on you. So we've been talking about becoming a better you, and uh, we've been talking about uh, having revival. And uh, again, I want to reiterate for some of you that to have revival does not mean to shout, run, and, and, and just act a fool for Christ. That comes after the revival. That doesn't bring the revival. So there's some other things that have to occur when revival's to come. And we've been looking at the book of Joshua preparing for the revival. And last week we talked about how we move from the wilderness to the promised land. And so I want to finish that discussion because uh, there was a couple of protocols that we, spiritual protocols that we recognize, but there's a lot more in here that we need to understand in order to move to the place where God would have us to be. So turn with me to Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3, and we're going to begin our reading at verse number 1. Uh, Joshua chapter 3, verse number 1. And in Joshua chapter 3, verse number 1, it reads like this. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim. In some of your Bibles, it may say Acacia uh, Groves. And they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, you and the Ark, about 2,000 cubits in length, which is roughly about a half a mile. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. And then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. That's what we want to fly off of. Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will, will do wonders among you. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his word. I want to talk uh, today for a few moments from the thought, the choice of a new generation. The choice of a new generation. Um, everybody makes choices from the time they get up in the morning till the time they go to bed, there's some choice that they've made during the day. People are defined by the choices they make and the consequences of those choices. There's no such thing as a non-choice. When you say, I have no other choice, that becomes your choice. And so people make choices all the time. Choice can be defined as a selection or an option, a decision or a preference. Matter of fact, I'm discovering that choices we've made at, as children uh, have shaped what we are today as adults. 
choices are important in order for us to move in a right direction. While the Jewish people despised the wilderness, as we talked about last week, and as they desired the promised land, despising and desiring is not enough. The new generation of Israelites stood on the precipice of a God-given choice. Remaining in nomadic slavery, wandering aimlessly, not knowing where they were going, and eventually dying in the wilderness, or the choice was to follow godly leadership that was in Joshua who was taking them into the promised land. This new generation had a choice. And while I illustrated last week, if you remember, I said that while they were despising the wilderness, what helped them to despise the wilderness and to desire the, the promised land is that they stood on the banks of the wilderness and could see, if you will, the grapes and the pomegranates and the milk and the honey. I, I want to clarify because actually they never saw the promised land. They wandered aimlessly for 38 years, total of 40, but aimlessly in the wilderness. And the truth of the matter is this new generation of Israelites never saw the promised land. And it blew my mind because while they never saw the promised land, they desired the promised land. So what was it that made them want to desire the promised land? I believe that while they didn't actually see it, they, they knew about it because Joshua had told them about it. He had described to them what the promised land looked like, and they could so see it vividly in their minds that I believe when they stood on the edge of the wilderness, they almost saw a mirage because they had a picturesque idea of what the promised land looked to them. Uh, I thought that was a little outlandish until I remembered a movie that I saw back in 1996. I know some of you weren't born, but back in 1996, there was a movie out, great movie, called A Time to Kill. And it was a movie with uh, Samuel L. Jackson. Actually, Samuel L. Jackson's in every movie, but this was a movie with Samuel L. Jackson, and it was about a, uh, a, a farmer, a migrant worker, whose daughter was uh, assaulted by two uh, white racist supremacists. And uh, they sodomized her, they brutalized her. And when they went to court, the, of course it was in the South, so the jury uh, let the men go. But Samuel Jackson took action into his own hands and killed the two men. So now he was on trial. And here this black man uh, sticking up for his daughter was on trial in front of an all-white jury. And he had a white uh, attorney who was fighting for him, and the, the uh, trial was not going well. Matter of fact, uh, Samuel L., his character, was as good as dead. They were going to lynch him. They were going to kill him for what he did. But in the final moments of the movie, his lawyer, who was uh, Matthew McConaughey, got up. And he gave a closing argument. And in the closing argument, he told the white jury, he said, I, I, I really fought for this man, and, and I don't think I'm going to win, and, and I just believe he's going to die. He said, but before that happens, I want you to do something for me. He says, close your eyes. And they closed their eyes. And he said, now I want you to visualize a young girl who is walking home from school and who is picked up by two men and thrown in a truck and brutalized and sodomized and then urinated on and then thrown in a river and then they tried to hang her but the branch couldn't support her so she dropped and lid but they beat her some more and then for fun threw beer cans at her. He was painting a picture of what went on with Samuel L. Jackson's daughter. And then after he finished it, he said, do you see it? Do you see her? Can you visualize it? Now visualize that she's a white girl. He allowed them without seeing to see. And I won't tell you the end of the story. I just gave it away. But they acquitted Samuel L. Jackson for what he did. The point is this, that I believe the nation of Israel stood on the bank of that wilderness, not ever seeing it, but visualizing it in their minds of what the promised land was like. And that visualization caused them to despise where they were. 
and desire where they were going. Saints, I just believe that God wants us to go someplace. I, I, I don't see it. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I do know what it's going to look like because eyes have not seen and ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men what God has prepared, but I know it's coming. And it's that visual that I see that makes me despise this life and want what God has for me. Are you with me here? And so seeing is not always with your eyes. Here's what they had to do. They had to trust God. They had to trust God's word and the witness of Joseph and Caleb. In other words, we talked about it, the protocol of following strong leadership and having a shared vision came into mind as they were moving out of the wilderness into the promised land. But they applied another protocol. Look at verse number 8, if you will. It says in verse number 8, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that was written. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Do y'all see that there? They got direction protocol, next protocol, from the Word of God. See, in order for us to move from wilderness to promised land, we need to know what we're doing. And we need some direction. And the direction doesn't come from the pastor. It comes from the Word of God. You've got to keep the pastor accountable that he stays in the Word of God. I was reading Ebony the other day because I couldn't watch TV. Interesting articles in Ebony. Felt like preaching them, but it wasn't the Word of God. I got to stay in the Word of God. And so they followed the word. They, they, uh, uh, they got directions from the word. And watch this. Not only did they follow it and get directions, but they applied the word. And when they applied it, they experienced success. You know why I want to hear testimony, especially during fast time? Because I want to see if folks are being faithful to what God has told them to do. See, uh, uh, somebody said today, uh, uh, God tells me to do something, but I see somebody else doing what God told me not to do, and I get confused over it because God's got something special for you and not them. So you better do what God tells you to do, and don't worry about what the crowd is doing. Do I have anybody listening today? So, so they got directions, and when they applied it, they got success. They had changed this nation of Israel, this new generation. And I want you all to see this because it was their forefathers, it was their fathers, their grandfathers that had actually come to the doorstep of the promised land and began to rebel to the point where they couldn't go in. So God let them wander aimlessly, and folks started dying off. So it was this new generation. Can, can I make it plain? I, I, my children always challenge me. There was a time when I could say to them, this is the way it is, and do this and do that. And guess what they do? They do it. Now that they're older, can think for themselves, paying rent, amen, hallelujah, and, and, and got some say, now they kind of challenge me. And when I say something, they say, well, why? And, I, you know, first time I, <laughs> what? But now I understand that everybody just doesn't understand some things. They need clarity. Now, now the fact that they challenged me as I was reading this, and that this is how I read the Scriptures and my mind opens up, I can imagine them just wandering in the wilderness for 38 years, and the older folk were like, this is the way it is. This is the way it's always been. We just wander aimlessly. And the young folks were like, why? Why are we doing this? Isn't there a better way? Why are we just want? Amen. They ask questions. And so as the older folks started dying out, they said, you know what? We don't have to stay here. We can move forward and go where God really wants us to go. And so they obeyed the word of God. God had begun to forge them into a unified army. That's the next protocol. See, one thing towards uh, uh, revival is when we're all unified. Now, they shared a vision. What's the vision? We got to get out of here and go there. But they came together where they leaned on one another and were strong and were a unified army. The Bible says this. It says, put on the whole armor of God 
that you may fight or stand against what? The wiles of the devil. Y'all know that scripture, right? Here's what happens in the church. Most of us do put on the whole armor of God, but we either spend our time shining our own armor or fighting one another. And while the devil sits back and watches us destroy one another, he laughs, moves in, and takes over. I know I'm preaching. That's why we have to become a unified front, a unified army. They became a unified army that would not be denied victory. Listen, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to let every obstacle get in my way. I'm not going to allow things to deter me from where God wants me to go. Some of us carry feelings too easily. Did I say that right? We catch feelings too easily. Amen. Somebody say something I don't like. Pastor said something. He, he, he offended me. I don't know you. I, I'm not following you around. I, I ain't got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> Amen. I slipped that in. That's the Holy Ghost talking. And if you're offended, that means he's stepping on your feet. Not the pastor. See, but we can't just take our ball and go home. We got to stand as a unified arm. Are y'all with me here? But then notice this, notice this, that not only uh, did they get direction from the word of God, but verses 10 through 11 says they got a God-ordained human authority. They, o- they were obedient to authority. Look at the text, verse 10 and 11. It says, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people. Pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions. For within three days, you are to pass over this Jordan to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God, here it is, is giving you to possess. Do y'all see that there? Notice what happens. He says, I'm giving you the land. It's going to occur in three days. But here's what you got to do. You got to prepare for it. Now, now, it blew my mind. I looked at that, and I kind of studied it and, 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 and looked at the, the, the word prepare. And, and what it really brought out was this, that God wants to give all of us something, but you just ain't ready for it. See, we want to be blessed, and God wants to bless you. But we don't want to put in the preparatory work to be blessed. There's some things that if God gave it to you right now, you couldn't handle it. Amen. Songwriter said, there's some things that God is doing that I can't handle right now. Amen. Are y'all with me here? But, but if God would prepare me, if I would prepare myself to receive it, then things would be better. So here he tells the nation, he says, listen, you, first of all, you got to be obedient to God-ordained authority. In, in other words, they were quick to adhere to the commands that Joshua gave. In other words, he said, get yourself together and let's move forward. See, in order for us to move forward, you got to get yourself together. Isn't that an old song? Got myself together. Yeah, okay. See, ya. I'm just seeing if you're awake out there. That's all. He says we've got to obey. We've got to understand what God wants us to do and begin to prepare for the next move. You know why we're not moving forward? Because we're not preparing. For the next move, we move one place, become satisfied, complacent, and I use this term, and begin to vacillate there and stay there. And usually when you stay, you get stuck. I'm not satisfied where I am. Glad I'm here, but I'm looking for the next move. I'm looking for the next level of God. That's higher heights and deeper depths in the Lord. Are y'all with me here? Now, notice this. I want to show you something. I don't think I have this in my notes, but I want to show you this. Look at verse 14. It says, your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But all the men of valor among you shall pass over armed before your brothers and shall help them. I read that. I like that. Because here's what it really says. It says we're preparing to cross. We're preparing to move. But there are those, watch this, that are already prepared. So here's what they're going to do. They're going to go first. Not for the purpose that because they're prepared, that gives them the privilege of going first. No, their reasoning for going first is so they can help those who are lacking. Somebody didn't hear that. You know why you're so blessed? So you can be a blessing. The reason God anoints your coffers with coins is so you can bless somebody who don't have coins. 
Oh, I know I'm preaching now. See, God didn't give you that raise so you can go out now and buy a bigger car or a new entertainment system. God gave that to you so you could be blessed. No, y'all didn't. So you can be a blessing. Still ain't caught it. Uh, uh, I shared this with the men the other day, so let me be very transparent. I try to share it very quick. My wife and I got away, and we got away at a, a, a resort. And, of course, because we were at a resort, we had to take the tour. Some of y'all going to catch this on the way home. And the tour is only going to take 90 minutes, but ended up being three hours. Okay, but see what we did for three hours because they offered us money, of course. So we said we're going to take all this for three hours because we're going to get some money. Well, long story short, they, they got us. They just got us. They got us. You know what that means. We got we got. got. Amen. And, and our plan going in was we ain't buying nothing. We ain't buying nothing. We ain't got no money. We ain't buying nothing. We ain't touching nothing. We ain't going nothing. We don't care what they say. They can offer the moon. We ain't buying nothing. They got us. My wife and I went out to dinner afterwards. We looked at each other. We said, what did we do? I said, I don't know. I don't know. That wasn't the plan. That night we went home, we slept, woke up the next day, I got on the bike, I was riding for an hour, couldn't turn the TV on, so I just started praying and thinking. And the Lord said, all that money you just bought, you could bless somebody. I, watch this, what he said, I'm, I'm being transparent. He said, I got you out of debt to be a blessing, not to go back in. I was on the bike, I was riding, I was sweating, it was long, I couldn't watch TV, so I had to watch the clock. <laughs> and I started crying and I said, Lord, how am I going to get out of this? And I heard in clear as day, quiet, no TV, read the contract. So I read the contract and sure enough, there it was. You got till January 18th to get out of this thing. And so I signed the paper, and I'm out. Out. Because I just consciously, the debt thing being one, but why would I want to spend all that money when I can be a blessing to the kingdom of God? Are y'all here with me? They went before because they were already prepared so they could help those who were behind come forward. That's what God's calling us to do. That's what unified army means, that we're all on the same page, and if you're not there, I'm going to help you get there. No man or woman left behind. Are y'all with me here? Now, 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 watch this. This is something interesting. The mantle had been passed to Joshua. They obeyed his strong, godly leadership. And as the mantle was passed to Joshua, I saw something. Because he gave commands and they followed. But that wasn't the thing that caught my eye. Uh, what caught my eye is, is that they obeyed without grumbling. Now, 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 now come, you know, don't get mad at me, but here it is. One thing I understand is that you, you do what you're told because of authority. But what I've discovered is even though I do what I'm told, sometimes I don't like it. And when I don't like it, I send anonymous letters. <laughs> I'm messing. Come on, y'all, just stay with me. The pastor said, we're going to do this. Man, I'm going to do it, but he's crazy. I don't like it. Sometimes we follow authority. Here it is, but don't like following it. Now, I, I didn't think when I said that I would get too many amens. So let me take it to your house. Look at your children. And you tell your children to do certain things, and they do it. Truthfully is, they're not bold enough to speak up with lip because they know they're going to get something backhanded. But they, come on, y'all pray with me now. But when you tell them to do something, they say, oh, I, I heard the story of a, of, a, of a young lady 
who, who uh, uh, mom told her to do something. She said, I don't want to do it. Slam the door. Mom took the hinges off the door for the rest of the year. She ain't had no door. I wish I, are y'all with me here? See, that's the kind of stuff I like. That's my house. You ain't going to be slamming my door. And, 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 and we do stuff. Come on here, somebody. But we really don't like it. And, and we tell our children to do stuff, and they don't like doing it, even though they do it. And they show that because as soon as you leave, they act the fool. <laughs> soon as you're not around, your children act up. Now, we get mad at them, but here it is. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to the end. Here it is. They only doing what they see us do. We talk about authority at home, but don't show it nowhere else. Now, I ain't even talking about church. How many times you come home, my boss gets on my nerves. I wish I, uh, 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 and start talking about the authorities. In, whoa, y'all ain't saying amen today. I'm stepping on some toes. He said, this is what I love about it. Not only had the mantle been passed, not only was Moses dead, but now it was Joshua's turn, but they followed him without grumbling. Now, how do I know that? Look at verse 16. Come on, come on. Look at verse 16. It says, they answered Joshua, all that you have commanded us, we will do. I'm talking about a unified front. And wherever you send us, what's going to happen? We will go. And just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Can I make this plain? Moses in a lot of churches never die. Y'all ain't going to hear me. What's that mean? You always hear somebody say, well, when Pastor Abraham was here, he gone, dog. We always want to bring up the farmer instead of looking. That's the old generation. The new generation says, I want to move forward. So it says, just as we obey, verse 17, Moses, in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Now watch this. This is what I love about a unified front. And whoever rebels against your command and disobeys your words, whatever you command, that person shall be put to death. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord. Only be strong and courageous. Now, you know what I like about that as a unified front? They weren't asking, watch this, y'all need to catch it. They weren't saying that if you don't obey, God going to put you to death. They said if we find somebody in the camp that won't listen, we got it. We'll take care of it. That's a unified front. Oh, no, 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 you ain't going to talk to him that way. Can I see you outside for a second? Just for a second outside. And get the bag over your head beat down. Some of y'all don't know about that. That's a Philly thing. I wish I had somebody go outside and wonder what hits you. Are y'all here with me? And so, so they obeyed. Now, now, now I, I want y'all to catch this, and I'm, I'm going to close with this. Israel had believed, the new generation had believed that they'd done everything that they were asked of. They despised the wilderness. They were looking forward to the promised land. They had made the right choice. They were following and obeying Joshua. They had made all the right decisions. And I know I'm in somebody's camp right now. But they literally stood on the doorstep of the promise. It, they were there. They had left the wilderness. They're standing on the doorstep of the promised land. They could taste a new life in their mouths. It was right in front of them. However, their entrance into the new land was blocked by a river. Now, I, I read that and, and the Lord just spoke to my spirit because I know that, and I hear it all the time, that's how I know. Folks say, I've been praying, I've been coming to Bible study, I've been serving God, I've been tithing, and still things ain't working out. Why? Because I've come to this river. And it's blocked. And now I don't know what to do. I've made all the right choices. Now I'm at this river. I'm blocked. What am I going to do? And here's the problem. That the problem is that when we get to the river and we get blocked, then a lot of us turn back. Many folks see the river as the straw that broke the camel's back. I've obeyed. I did what I was supposed to do. And this is the story of my life. Two steps forward, one step back. And here's what we do. Forget it. I'm going back to what I know. 
forgetting that you didn't even like back there, but you're going to go back there anyway. Are y'all here with me? And so that's how a lot of us are in situations. I really want to serve God, but I keep getting blocked at every turn. But what did Israel do? Israel put their trust in the one that God had given to lead them forward. In other words, they believed God so much that when Joshua said, I don't care what's in front of you, we still going to take the land. That's a ride and die type of attitude. Some of us love to be around folks that got that ride and die attitude. What? We ain't got no money? No problem. Let's do it. We ain't got no gas? Come on, we're going to make it on fumes. Let's, let's ride and die. I wish I had somebody. That's the kind, are y'all with me here? That's the kind of folks sometimes you want in your life. That when things look bleak, when things look dark, you want somebody to encourage you and say, look, don't give up. We can do this. I got a couple dollars. How much you got? I got 50 cents. Got to add up. Come on. We're going to make this thing happen. No matter what I see, it ain't going to stop me from my destiny from where God wants me to be. And so here's what they did. They saw the river. Watch this. Here's the deep part. They saw it. They saw the blockage. They saw this thing standing in front of their blessing, and they had no clue, listen to me, how to cross it. Now, when I say a river, most of us sometimes get the idea of a river being like, you know, a creek or a brook. Where why didn't they just walk across? No, we're talking about down in Chicago, I believe. Is that a lake or a river? Uh, a lake. Well, that's a lake. A river's bigger. And so crossing a river, they couldn't do it on their own. But yet they stood there with no idea of what they were going to do. Are y'all with me here? When we have gone as far as we can go and the way is blocked, what we going to do? So Israel put their trust in Joshua to lead them forward. And Joshua says to them, here we go. Look at uh, uh, chapter 3. Let's go over there real quick. Chapter 3, verse 5. Here's what uh, Joshua said to them. He said, here's what I need you to do. Consecrate yourself. Y'all see it? For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. They came to the very banks of the Jordan and stopped in their tracks with no idea how they were going to move forward. All they heard the leader say was, consecrate yourself. And I know that's a foreign word. Some of your Bibles may say it this way, sanctify yourself. In other words, can I, can I really make it plain? Put aside that weight because you're about to go over something. In other words, in order for you to see what God's going to do, you may have to sanctify, put aside, turn off, I wish I had somebody, some stuff in order for you to hear what God's about to do next. When you've done all you can do, stand and consecrate yourself. And here's the promise. He says, because tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Are y'all with me here? Now watch this. They came to the banks of the Jordan. And when you do your history, Jordan was below sea level. So which means what? That as they were marching out of the wilderness to the promised land, they actually went down to the Jordan. Uh Uh-huh. And the Bible says that while they were down in the Jordan, they had to stay there three days. I feel something coming right here. What do you mean? It means sometimes in your life, just like Jesus, you're going to have to go down. But in three days, you're going to come up. And you're going to watch what the Lord is going to do with you. Are y'all praying here with me? Now notice this. It gets better. Notice he says in verse number one of three. Then Joshua rose early in the morning and they set out from Shittim and they came to the Jordan. He and all the people of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. And at the end of the three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people that as soon as you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God being carried, follow it. In other words, when the word moves, you move. Just like that. When the word gets up, you get up. Just like that. You follow the word, and the word is going to take you over obstacles. Y'all still ain't caught it. Watch this. They were facing an obstacle called the Jordan River. Now, I want to show you something. This is deep. I told you this was the choice of a new generation. 
which means what? They had never seen the promised land. They had never seen the old land. Meaning what? Here it is. That when they came out of Egypt, y'all remember, and they came to the Red Sea, and there was also an obstacle that was barring them from going forward. They didn't know what to do there either. They didn't know how they were going to cross there either. But I heard Moses say, stand still and see the salvation of your Lord. Now watch this, watch this. So they stood there and watched as God, through the raising of the staff, where the waters rolled up, and they watched what God did. And after he rolled the water back, they were able to walk through on dry land. Are y'all with me here? But that was the old generation. We're talking about the choice of a new generation. This time, when they faced a similar body of water, this time God says, now watch this. I'm going to do something, but I'm not going to do it like I did with the old generation. See, they stood there and watched something happen. With you, I need you to step out and make something happen. Y'all ain't going to pray with me. And so the Bible says that when the word of God, which was housed in the Ark of the Covenant, stood up, watch this, they had to follow the Levitical priests, but they started to stay a half a mile back. And watch this, the waters did not flip up and dry up while they were standing there. It didn't flip up and dry up until the priests took a step. Y'all ain't catching this. They had to take a step into the water, which means what? When you've gone as far as you can go and the way is blocked and you don't know which way to turn, you got to trust Jesus to do something wonderful in your life. Consecration means to set yourself apart, to set yourself down and turn it completely over to God. Are y'all with me here? Y'all still ain't caught it. The old generation stood on the banks and watched God move. The new generation had to step in and watch God move. The reason some of us aren't being revived and the reason some of us aren't entering into our blessing is because we're still waiting for God to move. When God told you to move, Now, now, come on, I got to close. Here it is. Now, I'm not preaching that name it, claim it, you take one step, he take two. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm referring to when they stepped out on faith, it was literally this. Here's your problem. Instead of waiting for me to take care of your problem, step on your problem. Because simultaneously, as you step on your problem, you also step into your destiny. I wish I had help up in here. They had to cross over the, Red, the, the, the Jordan River, and when they stepped into it, they went over and crossed. See, I heard the songwriter say, the road gets rough and the going gets tough. And the hills are hard to climb. I started out a long time ago, but there is no doubt in my mind I've decided to make Jesus my choice. I'm just trying to tell you if you want to be revived, you got to make a choice of a new generation. Stop sitting back waiting to be blessed. Allow God to bless you as you go. Y'all still ain't caught it. Remember when the leopards came to Jesus and asked Jesus to heal them? They were waiting for Jesus to lay hands on them so they could be healed. The Bible says, Jesus said, go show yourself to the priests. That was an oxymoron. Why? Because when you were a leopard, you weren't allowed to be out. But by faith, they ran to the priests. And the Bible tells us that as they went, they were healed. I stopped by to tell you, you got to go in order to be blessed. 
You got to run by faith in order for God to do something in your life. Stop sitting on the premises and stand on the promises. Ain't he all right? 